Well, Christian music history is an interesting history to observe. See, in the 90s, this is really kind of when the phrase got coined, CCM or contemporary Christian music. We all remember Michael W. Smith when he came out, Amy Grant and others. But that was really the beginning of the worship resurgence that we had. So we had all these songs come out that were returning back to an authentic place of worship. So you had songs like Matt Redman, Heart of Worship. You had I Could Sing of Your Love Forever by Delirious. You remember these? Or A Shout to the Lord by Hillsong was the, the jam at the time. But in the early 2000s, the theme started to change. This is really when millennials started to take their, their cusp, but the first millennials were in the church, and the theme became changing the world. So the most popular songs at that time, the early 2000s, were History Maker by Delirious, Hands and Feet by Audio Adrenaline, and a new little fledgling worship team called Bethel Music, where you go, I go, what you say, I say, what you pray, I'll pray. And so these became the songs and anthems of my generation in the early 2000s. And so when we began to sing these, they really weren't worship songs, they were more prayers or requests for God to change the world. However, there was a tremendous problem when we started to sing these things. What happens when God starts to answer that prayer and wants to change the world through you? That's something we did not anticipate. It was the spring of 2002. I was an intern at the church. So at that time, I was just asked to preach my first message at the Rocks Youth Group. So again, when you're asked to speak, you're terrified. You don't know what to do. You don't know how to prepare. I pulled every Bible translation I had, put it in my room, and tried to read everything I could. And so as I'm there, the normal system was this. We'd wake up uh, early morning, 7 a.m. We'd go to our Bible study, and then we'd have class all day till 3. And then on this particular day, I had a Bible study, and then I had to go prepare my message at night for the Friday service. So uh, internship gets out. It's 3 o'clock. I run to the Lord's gym. Let me run from the intern house over to the Lord's gym. And as I'm running to the gym, I see this man with this giant wool jacket on. Again, this is hot springtime. We're talking high 80s or low 90s in the weather. A metal hard hat on and a giant trash bag filled with cans. And as I see him walking down the road, I hear the Holy Spirit say, offer to carry his bag. In which I reply, I don't have time to carry his bag right now. So I have this wrestle with the Lord. I run to the gym. I feel guilty the entire time. Finish my workout. As I'm running back, you know you begin to barter with God. God, just give me another opportunity in some other way. I see him again. Now over off the street down here by the Lincoln Library, okay? So I'm at the library and I'm, I'm terrified because I know that I have to do this thing. And somehow I convince myself that Going to my Bible study and preparing my message is more important than this opportunity. So I run through to Royer Park and now I just feel so low. I mean, I know I've blown an opportunity. I said, God, you know, forgive me tonight at the Bible study. Give me an opportunity to pray for someone. Maybe on Friday, there'll be an opportunity. Well, I pull around onto Douglas and I don't know how, I swear to you, there he is right by Shady Coffee. And I know God means business. So I go up to him. I said, sir, I was just, you know, I played off. I was just running by and noticed that you're carrying this bag. Can I carry it for you? He said, absolutely. I said, what's your name? He said, my name's Ralph. Now, Ralph was probably in his early 70s. And as I take his bag from him, it was incredibly heavy. I said, you know, where are you taking this to? He said, I'm taking it to the, the can depository right off of Darlene next to Chief's Liquor. I said, well, how about I walk this, you know, I'll carry this bag over there too. Could, would that be helpful? He said, absolutely, that'd be amazing. So as we're talking, going back and forth, it turns out that he's collecting cans up and down Vernon Street so he can raise money for his daughter, who's a single mom, to help contribute towards diapers and formula. So here he is, I'm carrying this bag. Again, totally misjudged the situation. But as we're there, I noticed that he's dragging his right leg. And as I see him drag his right leg, I said, Ralph, did you injure your leg somehow? He said, yeah, back in the war, I'm assuming Vietnam. He said, my friend stepped on a, on a, on a landmine. The shrapnel came and severed all the tendons in my right leg. I have no feeling in my right leg. I said, and again, not knowing what to do. Hey, I believe that God can heal. Would you mind if I pray for you when we go over to the, uh, the, the can depository? He said, ah, yeah, sure, why not? And so as we're there walking, he says, that's funny you mentioned that. He said, I've been meeting a lot of Christians lately. I said, really? Who have you been meeting? They're, they're these people from the Watchtower, Jehovah's Witnesses. Have you heard of them? 
And I know this is a God moment. I said, yes, I've heard about them. Talk to me about it. So we start going back and forth. And I realized this is an opportunity to reveal who the real Jesus is. And so as we walk over to Chief's Liquor, I set the bag down. I said, you know, Ralph, I've never done this before, but can we, can we pray for you? And I believe God's going to heal you right now. I say it. And I can't have time to take the words back. I don't believe he's going to heal him right now. But the words came out of my mouth. So I say it. And he's like, really? I'm like... I don't know, but we can give it a shot. And so I'm there and I've never done this. I've never seen it before. I said, um, I, I heard like Jesus put his hands on people. Do you mind if I put my hand on your leg? He said, sure. I said, where, where, where's the nerve pain at? And he says, right here. <laughs> I kid you not. We're at Chief's Liquor. I said, okay. So I get out on one knee and I put my hand on his groin. And I don't know what to pray. I said, I said, God, come and heal Ralph and touch his groin. <laughs> in Jesus' name, we pray, restore the nerves in his body. Amen. I said, do you feel any different? He said, no. I said, do you want me to pray again? He said, no, I'm fine. I said, well, why don't you try and move your leg? He says, okay. He says, oh my goodness. I could feel my leg. I could feel my leg. And he starts dancing in front of Chief's liquor, totally healed. And I'm there. Here's the closer. Fear of God hits me. And I say, okay, bye. And I run home. I, th I mean, the fear of God's there. I, I had no idea what to do. It would have been an ideal time to say, let me introduce you to your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, I trust that God was, he's the one that can finish that story. And God showed up in a big way. But see, there's these moments when God wants to show up and he wants to use us for an invasion of his kingdom. But I, like many of us, suffer from a certain condition. And that condition is called spiritual blindness. See, there are these opportunities that God has that he wants to invade his kingdom. And he gives us an invitation to see his kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven through you. However, I saw an inconvenience, not an invitation. It didn't fit in my schedule. Why? Because I had more spiritual things to do. I wasn't going home to play Xbox. I wasn't going home to do something that was recreational. I was going to a Bible study and preparing a message, but Jesus wanted me to be the message, not just write one. There's a difference that he's inviting us into. Now, John chapter nine is a brilliant chapter. It is so dense. John is such a different gospel than any of the other gospels. It's written most likely in the late 80s, early 90s. And he's taking the stories that kind of gotten lost in the traditions and bringing them back to light and revealing that Jesus is God. He's making these deity claims amongst these people. Now, we've been studying these certain situations. Again, John does a brilliant job of taking normal situations where the kingdom of God breaks in. And all these miracles are around water. So we have John 2, we have John 4, we have John 5. Now leads us to John 9. Now, John 9 has to do with spiritual blindness. That's the main theme that John is bringing up. And the main people in this story, other than the man that's healed, are the Pharisees. And he talks about this religious spirit. However, there's one other group that often gets over looked that has to do with spiritual blindness. And that's where we're going to start. John chapter nine, verse one says this. And as Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth and his disciples asked him, rabbi, who sent this man or his parents that he was born blind? Now, the question of the disciples is an appropriate question. This was a common cultural belief. See, they believed that if someone was born with a condition, either his parents sinned or he sinned. Exodus chapter 20, verse 5 says this. Says this. You shall not bow down or serve them, meaning idols, for I, the Lord, am a God, a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on their children to the third and the fourth generation. It's a big deal. This is what they believed. One scholar writes this. Because he was blind from birth, any sin the man himself might have committed would need to have been committed before he was born. How does that happen? They actually believed if the parents did not sin, that means the child sinned in the womb. 
And they developed this legend around Jacob and Esau. And they believed that Jacob was the chosen one of Israel, chosen of Yahweh, because Esau sinned in the womb. That's what they believed. So this was a common teaching of the time. However, what we learn is that the disciples have taken the broken beliefs of culture into their journey with Jesus. See, the disciples, they're the ones closest to Jesus out of anyone, and they're the ones asking the question. Why? Because that's what they were trained in and raised in. And we, just like the disciples, even though we're beginning a journey with Jesus, we bring in broken beliefs and limiting beliefs from our childhood and what we've been exposed to. We bring these questions in, but the journey of Jesus is to change our perspective and to change our mind. Romans chapter 12, verse two, do not be conformed to what this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is the context of repentance. And what Jesus does is he brings us in these moments to blow up our preconceived ideas, conditions that culture has taught us. All of us have these broken beliefs. There are things that we do that we don't understand why we do them. Paul talks about this in Romans 6. I do what I don't want to do, and I do what I do want to do, right? This is this conflict of sin within us. A great illustration that shows about things that have been passed on to us, and behaviors that we model, is called grandma's Easter ham. It's often used in business. Now, let's just talk a little bit about food. You ever have this, this gelatinous Easter ham? You know what I'm talking about? Now, let's just talk about food real quick. Everybody's got their specific traditions. Turkey is for Thanksgiving. Let's just be honest. There's no Easter turkey. It doesn't work. Prime rib is for Christmas. And for us heathens, ham is for Easter. Lamb is good. Ham is great. Now, when we talk about ham, it's not the canned ham. We're talking about real Easter ham. This is what we're talking about. We have Easter ham. You know the Easter ham that grandma would prepare. Well, there's a legend that goes like this. There's a new couple that was just married, and they were asked to prepare grandma's Easter ham. It was a tradition passed down to them. So as they are preparing this ham, the newly married wife then cuts an edge off the ham, removes it, and puts it in the pan and places it in the oven. The husband says, why on earth would you cut off the end of the ham? She says, that's the secret recipe of grandma. He says, that's pointless. It's a perfectly good piece of ham. And he says, where'd you get this? He said, my, my mom taught me how this. So they call mom. Mom, why do we cut off the end of the ham that grandma called her secret Easter ham? She says, well, grandma always did it that way. It makes it taste better. And the husband says, no, it doesn't. Who taught you this? So they, grandma had passed away at the time. They call grandpa at the elder care facility. They call grandpa. Say, why did grandma cut off the end of the ham? Grandpa says, oh yeah, that's right, she used to. But why did she do it? So that she could fit the ham in the pan that she would cook it in. <laughs> See, we are passed down these behaviors that don't make sense. And what Jesus wants to do is in our spiritual journey with him as disciples is change and reorder those old perspectives that we live by. Those old behaviors, those old patterns of belief. Here's what N.T. Wright says about this. Jesus firmly resists any such analysis of how the world is ordered according to culture. And in order to grow as disciples, we have to be prepared to dismantle some of our cherished assumptions. We have these ideas that we hold dear. These ways that we think things should be. A certain house we get to live in. A certain amount of money that needs to be in our savings. Then I'll find contentment. Jesus is after all those ideas. He can't wait to get a hold of those thoughts. Verse 3. And Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's work might be revealed in him. Powerful verse, a great verse. However, it's been misinterpreted for centuries. Why is this? This verse has been used as a justification for sickness and suffering in the life of a believer. It's a broken belief. That is not what Jesus is addressing. Put verse three back up there. He's talking about the glory of God being revealed in a situation. What he's doing is he's assaulting the religious worldview that they're living in and living under. Where they believe that they would never subscribe sin or sickness to Yahweh, therefore it must be the condition of the person. And Jesus says, I'm removing that from the conversation. God's glory is about to be revealed right now. 
The works of Jesus, the works of Yahweh are present. This is not some verse to justify sickness and suffering and saying God's going to get the glory through it. Here's the deal. Sickness and suffering don't glorify God. We glorify God in the midst of our sickness and suffering. That's very different. When he's led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, the spirit leads him. The devil's the one that does the tempting. When he comes, he's coming to destroy the works of the devil. We can't relish in sickness and suffering and just say, it's God's will. It's God's will. No, it's not. It's not how it works. Here's how we have to understand this. I understand there's genetic sickness and things that we struggle with and we wrestle through. I understand those things. But sometimes, let's just be honest, sickness is caused by demonic spirits. Not all. But if your spirit was a spirit of infirmity that was on somebody, would you say that's for God's glory? You don't know which one it is. So we pray for God's glory to come and heal that person. His spirit to come and set them free. We can't just come and, and believe that sickness and suffering is our lot in life. All of us will suffer. Suffering is inevitable. Even Jesus did so. And we praise him in the midst of suffering. We don't glorify the suffering. We don't glorify the sickness. That's a broken belief system. And Jesus is coming to remove that, that religious worldview. See, the religious lens sees someone that's sick or suffering, and they see sin. When you see someone that's sick or suffering, the religious worldview sees sin. But I want to push back. People say it's not religion, it's relationship. Yes, that's true. It's actually not religion, it's resurrection. That's what we're talking about. So the resurrected life, when they see sin, they actually see salvation. When you see sin in someone's life, you see there's an opportunity for salvation. That's the resurrection worldview. When you see sickness as a religious person, the resurrected mindset sees an opportunity for signs and wonders. That's what we see. When you see suffering in somebody, the religious worldview says they're suffering. The resurrection mindset says that's an opportunity to restore significance to someone that's been in despair. That's the different worldview we're called to live in. That's a good time to clap, church. Wake up. We need to start to live from this lens, this worldview. Ephesians 1, 17. He says he prays the spirit may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation that he opens your eyes to see. We need new eyes to see, church. The spiritual blindness we've been walking in is not what we're called to walk in in the future. We have to be ready to give up those broken beliefs. He then goes into this strange sentence in verse four and five. And he says, we must do the works of him while it's still day. Behold, night is coming. But while I'm here, I am the light of the world. People that really wonder about the mystery of Jesus asserting if he's God or not, only Yahweh was the light of the world. His assertion here is making himself equal with Yahweh. That's a big deal. So he says, I am the light. Now, when we talk about the light of the world, it's not Thomas Edison's light. It's not electricity that flips on and off. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about fire. We're talking about something that is dangerous. And if you stare at it too long, your vision will change. If you look at the sun too long, your vision changes. That's the context here. Now, for us that have a religious worldview, if we continue to try to hold two perspectives, our vision will be damaged. You have people that say, I really don't know God's future for me. I'm really confused. And oftentimes he's trying to remove a broken worldview or a broken lens so that you can see clearly. We just may not be willing to part with it. My uncle was a bodybuilder and again, was really obsessed with his appearance. And so my uncle would go to the gym all the time. And he would tan outside for hours on end. Back then, the tanning booth wasn't really a thing in the late 80s. So as he would go and tan outside, he wore glasses, but he would not wear them when he was around people because he didn't like how they looked on him. And so he got these uh, contact lenses prescribed. And the doctor said, don't wear them too long in the sun or they'll damage your eyes. So one day I go to visit my uncle and I come and he's wearing these big, heavy glasses and he has an eye patch on his right eye. So what happened? He said, nothing. I said, what happened? He said, I fell asleep. Fell asleep where? I was tanning outside and I fell asleep. And the contact lenses burned my retinas. He was given the warning. Hey, if you're in the sun too long, your eyes will be damaged if you're wearing that lens. 
When you're in the light of Jesus, in the light of the gospel, you wear that religious worldview, your vision will be damaged. And many have double vision. We call it double-mindedness. And unless you allow the Holy Spirit to remove that worldview, you will not see clearly to the future he's calling you to walk out and live in. We have to do this thing. Verse six. And when he said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with his saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes. John is so dense and knows exactly how he's writing this. There's multiple things going on in this one singular verse. Number one, it was the 39th rule on the Sabbath commandments of the Talmud that you cannot knead or make mud with your saliva. This is not biblical. This is Talmud. It's extra biblical law. Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. Number two, this is the obscure one. They believed that the fasted saliva of a rabbi had healing properties. So Jesus, a fasted rabbi, purposely spits. However, they could not use their fasted saliva on the Sabbath. He does that one too. <laughs> Rubs it in this man's eyes. But here's the big picture that John's connecting. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. This is a new creation act that Jesus is doing. This is a direct implication of Yahweh doing a creative miracle, a creative work at play. Genesis is the main theme that John echoes throughout his gospel. John 1, Genesis 1, mirror each other. All the miracles mirror the creation story, even to the resurrection narrative. Sean, I don't want to steal your message too soon, but Jesus comes out of the grave. Mary's in the garden. Who does she see Jesus as? A gardener. Who was the first gardener? Adam. Went over your head right there. <laughs> the new Adam has arrived in the new creation is what John's saying. He then goes and visits the disciples in this room where they're hiding. He breathes on them to receive the spirit. Genesis 2, 7, what happens? And Yahweh breathed life into Adam and he became a new creature, a living creature. This is a Genesis story, a new creation story that's taking place. A couple chapters previous, he has this conversation with a guy named Nicodemus. Nicodemus says, you know, what are you doing? How do I get to know the spirit that you speak of? He says, unless you're born of water and spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom. Verse seven, Jesus said, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. Why is this significant? They believed that this pool was the living water that flowed from the temple. And this living water was used in the tabernacle ceremony. And this is the water that they were pouring out when Jesus yelled, John 7, I am the living water. Anyone who is thirsty, come to me. He's making an absurd claim. He now goes and sends him to the pool called Sent. Why is this significant? Because John uses the word sent more than any other writer in all the, all the Bible. Because he's the one sent from God. Here's the picture. This man born blind receives the commission, washes in the water of the sent one, comes back able to see. He's now born again with a new vision, born of both water and spirit, just like he told Nicodemus in John 3. This is now really this new creation story as he starts to see a transformative work takes place. So much so, verse 8, the neighbors and those who had seen him before as, he, as a beggar began to ask, is this not the man that used to sit and beg? Verse 9, no, it's not him, others were saying. It's someone like him. And he had to say, I am the man. There's a transformative work that Jesus wants to do in you that your friends, neighbors, and family can't identify the person that was before to the person that is now. There's a work the Spirit wants to do in you. Now, a lot of us here have been saved a long time. You say, man, I remember those days. Those days are done, church. Those days aren't meant to be things we look back onto. Guess what? You now are the sent ones. You now are the ones that has the living water. And it's our job to help lead those to have new birth that they might see and are the testimony of the man born blind. That's our commission, church. It's not about the one day you were saved. It's about the day that God's brought in you to be the day of salvation for someone else. 
I'm excited at what God is doing. I got a testimony last night. Somebody just got saved in a community group. I'm like, that's the living gospel. I'm excited when I hear the story of my friend Cody on the back right, where he's transformed and his friends can't recognize him. That's the living gospel. And we get to have the ignition of the salvation spirit in us. That's the fire that the church is called to be in. That's what the light of the world is. Not on and off on a Sunday morning. Let's stand together. Holy Spirit, we just thank you that we stand as new creations in Christ. And we stand as those that can see. And we ask right now for those that have been living in the religious lens. Expose those broken and limiting beliefs. Expose those things in us that are distorting our vision. We say clarity for vision in Jesus' name. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Lord, we pray for those that are like that man born blind. They're there right now. And they're saying, you know what? I feel the stirring to give my life to Jesus. Speak to them, Holy Spirit. Show them, Holy Spirit, that you are the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through you. God, for those here that have had conditions of sickness and suffering, they've been praying for a long time. God, let this be the day of a miracle. This is the day the glory of God is revealed in the midst of their sickness, in the midst of their suffering. God, that we would repent of all those broken beliefs that we've held on to for too long.